book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. That saying has been repeated so often that it's been taken not only into the public domain, but also for granted. It goes without saying, yet people keep saying it. Allow me to unsay it. <laughs> Math is certainly a useful tool for predicting things and manufacturing gadgets. We can guide space probes to the planets. We can use x-rays to look for cavities in our teeth <laughs> and to see each other naked at the airport. We can use nuclear power to light our homes and to blow ourselves off the planet. The math is exact. The meanings seem to get lost in translation. There's been some controversy recently over the disregard afforded to several absurdities in modern mathematical physics. I'm thinking of the article, Fireworks Erupt Over Quantum Nonsense, in the September 22, 2012 issue of New Scientist. The precise predictiveness of the equations of quantum mechanics is cloaked in obscurity about their physical meaning. The exact explanatory power of general relativity describes a universe that we can't observe. The mathematics is clear, the meaning not so much. One must conclude with Karl Popper that the readers of this book of nature don't know what they're talking about. Nonsense expressed in differential equations is still nonsense. A common complaint against the electric universe, one which even I have made, is show me the math. But math is only a tool for sharpening ideas, lest we end up with abstract sharpness and nothing tangible to cut, we must first answer the demand to show me the English. <laughs> I think that the absurdity in modern physics arises in part from an unconscious assumption buried in the goes without saying saying, that the math represents the real world. In what follows, I'm limiting the idea of represent to the sense of embodiment of a quality. This overlooks a fundamental step in how people think, interpretation. Contrast math as representation, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, with math as metaphor. We understand nature like we read a math book. A metaphor maps similarities in a source domain usually things known or experienced at the human scale, to a target domain, things less known or unknown. The metaphor highlights the similarities. It may reveal other similarities. It may carry over logical relationships. It helps us to understand the things less known by making them feel familiar. What's often overlooked is that it also hides the dissimilarities. If we ignore this hiding function, we may think that the similarities are comprehensive and that the target is an embodiment of the source. We may think that the metaphor represents the target, therewith confusing analogy with homology. If the metaphor represents objects and relationships in the target domain, then there can be only one, or at least the several rep representations must be coherent. If you think several non-coherent metaphors represent objects and relationships in the target domain, you get a paradox. As metaphors, you can use more than one, even contradictory ones, to understand different sets of similarities. Metaphors can be complementary, where representations would be contradictory. For example, consider light as a particle and light as a wave. A particle, as metaphor, connotes a diminutive part of something solid, say a tiny marble. The math of collisions has a lot of similarities with the behavior of both marbles and light, and it can be used to predict certain results. A wave, as metaphor, connotes something liquid, say an undulating surface. The math of undulations has a lot of similarities with the behavior of both water waves and light, and it can be used to predict certain results. On the other side, the side of hidden dissimilarities, a photon in atomic theory can't be rolled between your thumb and forefingers like a marble. The equations that correlate atomic behavior with marble behavior don't have glassy textures. An equation is not a marble. 
Neither is a photon a marble or an equation. A wave in the source domain, the water in a pond reacting to a marble dropped into it, is the result of many drops of water moving in a coordinated pattern. Light is a coordinated pattern of changing electric and magnetic field strengths. Nothing moves. A sine function has similarities to both kinds of coordinated patterns, but is neither a pond nor an electromagnetic field. There is no representation. The electromagnetic field strength isn't wet. The wetness gets hidden and overlooked, just as in a literary metaphor. The snow blankets the ground, gives an understanding of snow as a cover, like a blanket, perhaps keeping seeds warm. The fact that snow isn't woven from fibers doesn't even occur to us. As metaphors, particles and waves are not contradictory, not paradoxical, not absurd. But error sneaks in when we start thinking that snow is a polyester and photons are round. One implication of this is that the important criterion for the evaluation of metaphors is aptness rather than veridity. How well does the metaphor enable us to understand the target domain or data set with respect to our goals, values, instrumentation, and so on? The math is apt in some conditions and not in others. If you squeeze an equation, you don't get the juice of truth, you get the rind of similarity. Truth, on the other hand, has more to do with whether the actual state of affairs, the facts, corresponds with what theory predicts. Unfortunately, this criterion is inherently circular. Stephen Toulmin wrote of the continual interaction of theory with fact, the way in which theories are built on facts while at the same time giving significance to them and even determining what are facts for us at all. Is an electron a particle with momentum or a current carrier in a circuit? Or is it a metaphor that aptly enables us to calculate observed changes in energy? When confronted with alternative theories, and hence with alternative facts, adherence to representation must resort to fervency of belief that their theory is the one and only really true one. True believers in different theories necessarily talk past each other without understanding, confirming Popper in his opinion that no one knows what they're talking about. Math as metaphor means that it can't give you truth outside the theory for which it is apt. Other metaphors may enable you to understand other similarities that you would otherwise dismiss as anomalies. Truth is a criterion for aptness more than a judgment of representativeness. A more apt metaphor would be domains of validity. Particular selections of facts, as interpreted by particular theories from particular selections of data, enable us to do particular things. Different selections enable us to do other things. For example, Newtonian mechanics, the mechanics of gravity and gas, enables us to send rockets to the planets. The aptness is with respect to modern culture, its goals, its values, its history, and so on. Newtonian mechanics would have been useless, even nonsensical, to Arist Aristotelian society. Aristotelian mechanics was more apt for a horse-powered culture. Now that we are becoming aware that the universe is composed of plasma, which has electrical properties, a theory of an electrical universe is more apt. The book of nature is a metaphor, but math is not English. Writing equations is not the same as writing predicates. A mathematical derivation can be proved. It follows the rules. But applying it as a predicate for real things and events must be critically examined and tested for aptness. The metaphors of predication are not so much propositions to be proved as opportunities to be chosen. That's it.